Okay, we're going to look at determining when a function is increasing and decreasing, or the intervals on which that happens, and using that information to find local extrema. So remember that a function increases when its derivative is positive and decreases when its derivative is negative. And we'll be using that fact throughout. Um, and when we are finding the intervals of increase and decrease, uh, the game plan will be to start by finding all critical numbers and discontinuities for your function f of x. Then we're going to use a number line to determine the sign of the derivative for the intervals that are broken up by those x coordinates we found up here. So do remember critical numbers, that's going to be when your derivative is equal to zero or your derivative does not exist, but do remember the critical numbers must be in the domain of the function. That will come up a little bit later. Also, for this video, I'm going to assume that you know how to find derivatives and clean them up so that critical numbers can be easily found. So I will skip the little bitty steps showing how to find a derivative and how to factor and all that crap. So, moving on with question number one. We are going to find the intervals on which these functions increase and decrease. So my first function is a cubic polynomial. And when you find the derivative and factor it, the derivative factors 2, 3 times x plus 1, x minus 5. If you don't believe me, do it yourself. I'm going to set this equal to 0 to find my critical numbers. And this function has critical numbers at x equals 1 and 5. So what I will do now is I'm going to draw a number line and I'm going to plot my critical numbers on the number line. Please make sure you put them in order. Every now and then I'll see somebody put the larger value on the left side, so just be careful with that. And I like to label my number line because over the course of calculus we will be analyzing the function, the derivative, and the second derivative all at the same time. So number lines need to be easily recognizable for what they represent, and this one is representing the derivative. I like to put zeros above these two critical numbers because if I plug negative 1 and 5 into my derivative, I will get a zero as a result. So I'll put zeros above negative 1 and 5, and then I will pick test values on these intervals. So I'm going to pick maybe negative 2. That's on the left side of negative 1. The interval negative 1 to 5 has 0 in it. If you can plug in 0, then do it. That's a nice number. And then 6. And I want to determine when the function is increasing or decreasing, which is determined by the sign of the derivative. So all of these test points, negative 2, 0, and 6, we will plug into the derivative. So f prime of negative 2 would be 3 times negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1, negative 2 minus 5 is negative 7, and I really don't care about the actual value. All I care is that that is positive. So if negative 2 gave me a positive result, then so will every other number on that side of negative 1. I will repeat for 0, and I will repeat for 6, and determine whether my derivative is positive or negative for those two values. And there we go. So I test my derivative. I found my derivative is positive, then it's negative, then positive. And then I look at that. And now I can say with confidence that my function is increasing on the interval negative infinity, negative 1. And then again, from 5 to infinity. And I know that because my derivative is positive. So I'm going to state that f prime of x is greater than 0 on those intervals. And similarly, I can say that my function f is decreasing on the interval negative 1 to 5 because my derivative is negative. Now, I'm going to take a minute to talk about AP calculus and the AP exam. So if you are not in AP calculus, you can skip this part. But the role of number lines on the AP exam is that the number line does not count at all. So when you are through using your number line to determine your intervals of positive and negative, pretend it's not there and look at the rest of your work and see if the rest of your work is sufficient by itself. So right here, I said that my function is increasing because the derivative was positive. If I make a statement that the derivative is positive, then I have to have some amount of work shown that I determined that the derivative was positive, and I did that right here and right here. You absolutely must write down where you evaluated the derivative and whether that was a positive or negative result. Same thing for the derivative being negative. Right here, I have legit math showing that I tested the, der the derivative 
for some value on the interval negative 1 to 5, and I found that that value of the derivative was negative. The pluses and minuses on the number line do not count as supporting work. So when you're through doing these, if it's an AP exam problem and it's a free response, if you have to justify an answer, completely cover up your number line and look at everything else and make sure that your work still supports your statements because the number line is invisible to, a, to an AP exam reader. All right, so let's move on. That was question number one, and I'm not going to talk about the AP exam anymore after that. So question number two, we have a rational function this time with two polynomials in numerator and denominator, and the derivative cleans up to negative 20x over the quantity x squared minus 9 squared. That will be a quotient rule cleaned up for you. We will set that equal to 0, and this derivative equals 0 at 0. That is the only critical number. But you always, and we should do this even before we do derivatives, look at your original function and look for potential issues. And this function, if you factor that denominator, you will determine that you have vertical asymptotes at x equals plus and minus 3. Now, while those are not critical numbers by definition, they are important enough that they need to go on your number line. So when I do my number line for this one, again, I'm going to test my derivative. So this number line represents my derivative. I have one critical number of 0, and then I have two other numbers, negative 3 and positive 3, that are very important. We cannot officially call them critical numbers because they are not critical numbers by definition, but they are very important. Now, above each of these special numbers, I will put how I got them. I got 0 because that makes my derivative equal to 0. I got negative 3 and 3 because those are vertical asymptotes of the original function. So I label above my initial values what gave me those values. I have two vertical asymptotes and a 0, and then we have four intervals to test. I'm going to plug in negative 4, I'm going to plug in negative 1, I'm going to plug in 1, and I'm going to plug in 4. And do remember that we are testing those in the derivative, and you must show the step where you've actually plugged in your derivative. So f prime of negative 4, negative 20 times negative 4, would be positive, and I'm going to be a little bit lazy here. That's something positive. My denominator is really nice, because as long as I don't plug in 3 or negative 3, which I won't do anyway, because those are already on my number line, I will always get a positive. My denominator squared will always yield a positive. And so f prime of negative 4 does give me a positive result. And then I will repeat that for my other three intervals. And there are the rest of the intervals and whether those intervals are positive or negative. Now remember, this number line is invisible. It does not count as work shown. I said I wouldn't talk about the AP exam, and there I went. So my conclusion, when I'm looking for intervals of increase and decrease, I can look at that number line, and I can now say that f increases on the intervals when the derivative is positive, so that will be negative infinity. And we have to stop and take a break at negative 3 because my function is not defined at negative 3. So we increase on negative infinity to negative 3, then negative 3 to 0, and I know that because my derivative is positive. And then f decreases on the intervals 0 to 3, and then again from 3 to infinity because on those intervals we have determined that my derivative is negative. So there's your answer for that problem. Find the derivative, find your critical numbers and any other special values, and then test all of the determined intervals from those values. One more before we talk about local extrema. So we have a function here, x to the 2 thirds, and the derivative ends up being 2 thirds x to the negative 1 third. Now for calculus, negative exponents are beneficial because it makes it easier to do the power rule. However, when it comes time to doing the algebra and you are solving equations, I prefer positive exponents. So I'm going to take that negative exponent and move it down here with the 3. And so I have 2 over 3x to the 1 third. And then we will set the derivative equal to 0 because that's how we determine our critical numbers. Well, a fraction is equal to 0 when your numerator is 0. Well, my numerator is 2. My 2 will never equal 0. So there is no solution for that equation. My derivative will never equal 0. But, but you always want to be aware if you have x's in a denominator, that that denominator cannot be 0. And I'm noticing that if I try to plug 0 into my derivative, I get a non-existent result. I cannot divide by 0. So f prime of 0 does not exist. So that is a special point. I know I'm going to put that on the number line. But before I do that, before I just put a 0 here and start 
testing my, uh, testing my intervals, I need to know exactly what zero is. So my derivative fails to exist, and my function, if I try to plug zero into my function, I actually get a real number result. Zero to the two-thirds is zero. So my derivative fails to exist, but my function does exist. That means that x equals zero is a critical number. And that's the critical number people tend to forget about, the case where the derivative fails to exist. Um, so we do have a critical number at zero. Now, I'm not going to put a zero up there, because if I put a zero above zero on my number line, then that tells me that my derivative is equal to zero. My derivative didn't equal zero. My derivative does not exist. So I'm going to put a DNE up there to remind me that that is a weird non-differentiable point. And then we will plug in negative one and positive one to my derivative, f prime and negative one find f prime of 1 and determine whether I have a positive or negative derivative on each side of that critical number. So there we go. We determined that my derivative is negative, then non-existent, then positive. That means that my function, as far as increasing and decreasing, my function increases on the interval 0 to infinity because my derivative is positive and my function decreases on the interval negative infinity to zero because my derivative is negative. So there we are finding intervals of increase and decrease through the number line. And remember, the number line is invisible. Now, once you know how to determine when a function increases or decreases, you can then determine where your function has local extrema. And that is called the first derivative test. So the first derivative test uses those intervals of increase and decrease to determine the x-coordinates where you have a local max or a min. And remember that all local extrema, all local extrema will occur at critical numbers. Absolute extrema is different. Then you have to consider endpoints if endpoints are given in the question. But for local extrema, also known as relative, so I may write that in here, local is also known as a relative extrema. So if you see relative, it's the exact same thing, just a different word. All local extrema will occur at critical numbers. So when I'm determining local extrema, I start with critical numbers. And we are going to analyze the same three functions that we just worked on. Um, and we'll do that with the first derivative test. I forgot the slide was in here. I'm trying to salvage this. OK. So the first derivative test in words, if you have critical number, x equals c for a function f of x, a local max occurs when the derivative changes from positive to negative. Derivative changes from positive to negative. Because if your derivative is positive, your function increases. If your derivative is negative, your function decreases. And if you change from increasing to decreasing at a critical number, that will be a local max. If your derivative changes from negative to positive, a negative derivative means your function decreases. A positive derivative means your function increases. And if you change from decreasing to increasing at a critical number, that will be a local minimum. So that is the mechanics of your first derivative test. So now looking at the first three problems that we worked on earlier. So this is number one. We found the intervals of increase and decrease. And for number one, we determined that we increased to negative one, decreased to five, then increased to six. If I change from increasing to decreasing, that makes negative one a local max. My function is increasing, then my function is decreasing, therefore maximum. A minimum occurs at 5, because at 5 we can see that my derivative is negative and then positive. We are decreasing and then increasing. And so we can use the first derivative test to determine that f has a local max at x equals negative 1 and a local min. at the x-coordinate of 5. Now, back to the question, it says find the local extrema. It doesn't st say specifically to find the x-coordinates. And if it doesn't explicitly say find the x-coordinates, then you should also find the y-coordinates of your local extrema. So it's not only asking what the x-coordinate is, but exactly how high and how low does it go. To find the y-coordinates, to find y-coordinates, any y-coordinate on a graph, but in this case specifically the y-coordinates of your local extrema, to find y-coordinates of your function, then you plug the x into the function. So plug your x value 
into f of x, and this is like algebra one stuff. This is algebra one stuff, but uh, we tend to sometimes forget we need to plug into the derivative, the second derivative, the function, and in this case, I will plug negative one into the function to find out exactly where the local max is. I will plug five into the function to find out exactly where the local min is. So I'll do that really quick. And there we go. So I plugged in negative one and five to the function and I determined the coordinates of my local max are negative one and 16 and my x and y coordinates of my local minimum are five, negative 92. So I'm gonna do the last two pretty quickly. So number two, I'm looking for local extrema, and that means I need to look at critical numbers, and there's only one critical number here, that's at zero, my derivative change from positive to negative. That means there's a local maximum at x equals zero because the derivative change from positive to negative. We're increasing, then we're decreasing, and so there's a local max at x equals zero, and then we'll plug zero into the function to determine the y-coordinate, and this one's gonna be easy. Zero squared plus one over zero squared minus nine, and so my local maximum is at the point zero, negative one-ninth, and that's all there is to number two. Uh, and it didn't happen, but every now and then at a vertical asymptote, your derivative will change signs, but those are not critical numbers. So even if, for example, my derivative was positive over here, Three is not a critical number, so you still would not have a local minimum at that uh, x coordinate. So pay attention to uh, your discontinuities versus your critical numbers when determining local extrema. And then our last one, number three, uh, my derivative is changing from negative to positive, so I'm thinking there's a local minimum. My function's decreasing, then my function's increasing. The thing is the derivative fails to exist, but that doesn't matter because it is a critical number. We established that the derivative doesn't exist and my function does. Zero is a critical number, therefore there is a local minimum at x equals zero, and again I'll plug zero into the function and zero to the two-thirds is zero, so my local minimum is actually at the origin. And this one, we have a local minimum where the derivative fails to exist. If you actually graph the function x to the two-thirds, it looks like a, those little seagulls you saw in kindergarten looks something like this, and there is a cusp at the origin, and that's why the derivative fails to exist, and that is a local minimum. Uh, so, so just pay attention to critical numbers. If the derivative doesn't exist, make sure that the function does. All that good mess. This video took a lot longer than I thought it would, so I'm going to go ahead and quit. Hope this made sense.